The SOA Students' Union Pakistan Society was established in 1968 and has since grown to become one of the largest societies on campus. More than a society, it is a culturally diverse community that celebrates Pakistani heritage. We aim to continue to pr provide a platform at SOAS and beyond to stimulate discussions on contemporary issues in Pakistan. SOAS students and staff have played an instrumental role in the struggle for progressive Pakistan. Today's lecture is hosted in collaboration with Bloomsbury Pakistan, which is a research and resource center that promotes progressive causes in Pakistan through academic research. Bloomsbury Pakistan has previously co-hosted the first Asma Jahangir lecture, which was delivered by Professor Martia Sen. The SOAS Pakistan Society and Bloomsbury Pakistan have previously hosted seminars, discussions, and conferences focusing on human rights, freedom of speech, rights of religious minorities, and democracy. I would like to take this opportunity to thank Dr. David Taylor and Nader Chima for their continued support for this year's flagship event. Without further ado, I will now introduce our chair for the evening, Dr. Martin Lau, who is currently the professor of South Asian law at SOAS and was the former dean of the Lums Law School in Pakistan. Dr. Martin. Thank you. Yes, thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, dear colleagues and friends, before we actually start with proper introductions, I must say that I feel a bit rusty. This is also, it's not only the second Asma Jahangir Memorial Lecture, but actually one of the very first kind of public events we're actually holding, holding at, at SOAS and in this lecture theater after two and a half years of a terrible pandemic, which kind of yes, cost many people's lives and wreaked havoc. So, so I'm really pleased, I must say, that life is kind of slowly returning to normal and that we are now again assembling in person in a lecture theater at SOAS. This event is also being live streamed, so I'm also welcoming the audience uh, across the globe who are actually now dialing in and, and listening and, and are looking forward to the lecture. I feel very honored and indeed very pleased to have been asked to chair the 2022 Asma Jangir Memorial Lecture to be delivered by Justice Kazi Faiz Isa of the Supreme Court of Pakistan. The title of Justice Isa's lecture is The Role of the Judiciary in Upholding Democratic Rights and Processes. Tonight's lecture will be introduced by Mrs. Solima Jahangir, Asma's daughter and an accomplished lawyer, researcher, educator, and activist herself. My function tonight is limited to the role of the chair. So in fact, I've been given just a few minutes to do these introductions, but I'm still going to, before introducing Sulema Jahangir, I'm going to share with you that SOAS and the School of Law are extremely proud and indeed honored to host tonight's lecture. Across SOAS, a number of departments, academics, students and researchers are closely engaged with the study of Pakistan. And this is across the departments of history, economics, politics, and of course, languages. In fact, I myself in 1987-88 studied Urdu under Professor Christopher Shekel, the author of the first Suraiki English Dictionary. So my own connections to Pakistan studies also kind of aged me a little bit. <laughs> I do not think it would be wrong to describe SOAS as the world's leading center for the study of Pakistan. And in fact, when Mahin spoke just now, I kind of took note of the fact that SOAS Pakistan Society dates back to 1968. The link between the school of law and Pakistan is particularly strong. I do not have any precise numbers, but it is clear from my own teaching at SOAS over the past 30 years that a significant proportion of those practicing law before the Pakistani courts today actually obtained the law degrees at SOAS. And in fact, I'm very proud and pleased that we have a number of Pakistani students in the law school today, and many of them will 
go and become barristers and return to Pakistan and practice and hopefully, and not hopefully, but surely make a positive uh, contribution to the development of Pakistan's legal system, including the rule of law and the protection of human rights. Asma Jahangir was very much part of the SOAS community as well, and indeed the school of law. Whilst I was at SOAS, she delivered a number of lectures at SOAS and in the school of law. She taught a few classes. She interacted with our students and colleagues over many decades. Asma's legacy lives on in her writings, in her advocacy as reflected in a number of reported Pakistani judgments, and of course, in the many human rights reports she had authored. Asma's legacy also lives on as a role model for our students, as a fearless, courageous, outspoken, and principled female advocate who made a unique and lasting contribution to the protection of human rights globally and, of course, in Pakistan. Asma's legacy also lives on in her daughter, Solima Jahangir. It's my pleasure to, to introduce her to you. And in fact, Suleiman, I chatted yesterday over dinner about the last time when actually Asma and Suleiman, I had had a lunch at Olivetti's in Store Street. And yes, what I take away from this lunch was actually how much fun it also was to kind of spend time with Asma and, and with Suleiman, you know, how much we laughed. And yes, it's, uh, it's, it's very sad that she isn't here with us. But... As I said, Asma's legacy lives on in her daughter, and I'm going to take just a few minutes to introduce Suleiman to you. Suleiman studied law at Cambridge University in 2003. She graduated. So yes, one of the few Pakistani lawyers at her level who did not study at SOAS. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, she then, and that kind of reflects uh, her, her, her aptitude for law, joined Freshfields Brookhouse Daringer, one of the magic circle law firms, uh, with a training contract, then as an associate lawyer with Freshfields. She worked there for five probably very, very long years, day and night, and then transferred into family law, which really is her passion and her current kind of expertise. She, after leaving Freshfields, she worked actually in she worked in Pakistan with Asma and with Asma's sister Hina Jilani in their law firm in, in, in Lahore, AGHS Law Associates. She then returned to the UK, to London, and joined the law firm Dawson and Cornwall, which really is the English leading, perhaps one of the world's leading uh, law firms specializing in, in family law. There's quite a long kind of section on, on her expertise, but I think it's fair to say that uh, Suleiman kind of uh, specializes in international family law, but is also dual qualified. She is also a member of the Lahore High Court Bar Association and frequently acts as an expert witness here in England in proceedings involving Pakistani law. She is also a visiting lecturer for Gender and Development, part of the MPhil course at the Center of Development Studies at the University of Cambridge, and a fellow of the International Ac Ac Academy of Family Lawyers, uh, Law Asia, the Pakistan Bar Council, and I already mentioned the Law High Court Bar Association. She told me that I shouldn't really read out the whole CV, and I'm afraid it's quite a dense and rich CV, and I'm quite aware that I'm already kind of beyond my five minutes. So it's my great pleasure to actually introduce you and, and uh, hand over to, to, to Suleiman. Please, thank you very much. Thank you, Martin, for that very flattering introduction. Uh, Assalamu alaikum. Good evening. Um, Honorable Judge of the Supreme Court of Pakistan, uh, Justice Kazi Faiz Isa, Honorable Judges, uh, colleagues and friends. Uh, thank you for inviting me to say a few words this evening. Uh, I want to start by wishing everyone a happy International Women's Day today. 
on this day, uh, what is most pressing on my mind, and I'm sure many other minds, is the rights are the rights of our uh, Afghan neighbors and sisters. Uh, we have seen horrendous stories come out of Afghanistan, and being neighbors, it has impacted us. When a girl child is sold in Afghanistan for food, the impact is not just felt in Afghanistan, but in Pakistan and around the world. On this day, I want to take a moment to salute our Afghan sisters for standing resolutely in the face of brute violence, even after world superpowers fled and abandoned them. I want to start by thanking our organizers, Bloomsbury Pakistan and the SOAS Pakistan Society. In particular, I would like to thank my dear friend Nader Chima for his dedication in putting this event together. Bloomsbury uh, Pakistan also co-hosted the first Asma Jahangir lecture that was delivered by Professor Amartya Sen and Mr. Ayer Rahman uh, with Dr. Nilanjan Sarkar from LSE. I want to take a minute to describe AGHS Legal Aid Cell, which was the legal charity that was founded by my mother. AGHS still continues to work tirelessly for thousands of vulnerable people in Pakistan by providing free legal representation and assistance to them. Every year, they provide free legal representation in about 1,500 cases, and they continue to consult with parliamentary bodies and other NGOs on drafting legislation and policy making. On behalf of everyone, I want to extend a very warm welcome to Justice Isa today. Justice Isa needs no introduction for anyone who has knowledge of Pakistan. He is the senior most puny judge of the Supreme Court of Pakistan. Justice Isa practiced law before all courts in Pakistan for about 26 years before he was elevated to the bench. He was the senior partner and head of litigation in one of Pakistan's leading law firms. He was the chief justice of Balochistan High Court and was elevated to the Supreme Court of Pakistan in 2014. During his time, Justice Isa has delivered several important judgments touching upon fundamental rights and holding state and non-state actors accountable, often in very, very difficult situations. He has also headed commissions. More significantly, he produced an extremely detailed report uh, in the wake of the suicide bombing and killings in Quetta that saw 70 people dead and 130 injured, many of whom were lawyers, actually. In the Fezabad judgment, he held to account those he deemed responsible. And this was a very difficult case, often with a lot of political sensitivity. He held state and non-state actors accountable and directed that federal and provincial governments to prosecute those who were spreading hate, terrorism, and extremism. But saying all that, I think what Justice Isa is perhaps best known for is his stand for independence of judiciary and judicial accountability, even in very challenging times. It is therefore no surprise to me that he's asked to speak on this topic, on the role of judiciary in upholding democratic rights and processes. Today's topic and speaker was independently chosen by the students at SOAS. We are here also to celebrate the legacy of my mother, Asma Jahangir. What she was admired and remembered throughout the world was in her ability to speak truth to power and speak truth to power at challenging times and very, very clearly. For her, it was not about personalities, but principles. Many thought that she was taking an unpopular stand, but she was committed to the principle. For example, when MQM leader Altaf Hussain was blacked out from appearing on any media channel, she defended him because she felt that his right to express himself was, was violated. Nowhere does our law state that an absconder, someone we don't like, someone we find we can't vote for, is not allowed to express himself or herself. We, are, we now see that even thrice elected Prime Minister Mia Nawaz Sharif, leader of one of the largest parties, political parties of Pakistan, has been blacked out from the media. Similarly, Asma defended Hussein Akani in the Memogate case, 
as she felt that he was being denied due process on the pretext of fundamental rights and that such a judicial precedent was dangerous for democratic rights and democratic processes. Ironically, the petitioner in that case, Mia Mohammed Nawaz Sharif, is now subjected to a similar fate. And what we have now is one of the worst times for freedom of expression in our country. The introduction of further penalties on free speech through an ordinance to pick our laws is undemocratic and chilling in the way it will impact fundamental rights. I ask, should, a law, should such a law be upheld when it is used to prosecute and witch hunt political opponents? For asthma, no. Justice was not just interpreting what is written in our statute books, but upholding human dignity and equality. In our statute books, we even have punishments of stoning to death, of lashings, of amputations. Yet we have not seen such punishments being handed out by our judiciary because our judiciary is aware of the public outrage such punishments will cause. In fact, I think my mother would have said that if hands are to be amputated, then half of Pakistan's upper class would lose their hands for financial embezzlement. And possibly, if PICA law is to be used in the way it is intended, then we will see many independent voices and journalists behind bars in the months to come. My mother Asma was firmly democratic in her views and in her practice. She did not believe that judges should take oaths under military dictatorships or pursue any agenda in a civil military relationships. She was a firm believer in judicial accountability and judicial independence. In fact, when political leaders were disqualified by the judiciary on the basis that they did not fulfill the criteria of sagaciousness and truthfulness under Article 62 and 63 of the Constitution, she believed that if such high moral standards were to be adhered to, then we would have no parliament left or even judicial benches left. She was also the first to support examples of judicial courage, judges refusing detention, judges upholding fundamental rights, and instilling progressive interpretations to legislation. We hope that when his lordship is leading the apex court, we will see much needed judicial reforms. The fixation of judicial benches on a case by case basis has been troubling for lawyers and litigants alike. It has also pointed fingers of judicial bias, particularly in politically sensitive cases. Suomoto has become a household name since the tenure of Justice, Chief Justice Iftikhar Chaudhary. Rules around PIL cases and the formation of a constitutional bench should ensure that PIL cases are used to advance fundamental rights and not to encroach on executive domain. We keep on hearing of the over 2 million cases that are still to be disposed of in Pakistan judicial system. There have been efforts now and then to clear the backlog, at least in superior courts. We also appreciate that our judiciary is under intense pressure and under-resourced. When a circuit judge who is present with us here today was visiting Pakistan, and she has one of the busiest lists in England, she was, she was amazed when she saw the list of a Lahore High Court judge. So I am aware of the intense pressure our judiciary works under. Last but not least, we hope to see a bench that is equivocal in upholding the rule of law without fear of favor for everyone, and is not afraid to hold state and non-state actors accountable for excesses. For ordinary citizens, Justice is not about taking popular stands or political grandstanding. It is about ensuring certain and expeditious justice without compromising due process. Finally, I wish to express a deep appreciation that Justice Isa has generously taken his time out to be with us here today from Pakistan. 
As juniors and on behalf of the students present here today, I wish to say that we always look up to our seniors, judges, but it is not always so that our senior judges have the accessibility and humility to engage with us in forums such as these. Justice Isa has always shown us the generosity of his spirit in engaging with us with the same curiosity and respect as we undoubtedly have for him. And we are most thankful for that. Thank you. I now invite Justice Isa to deliver his lecture for today. Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim. In the name of Allah, the most beneficent, the most merciful, I start with. And I extend my greetings to you all. Assalamu alaikum. Peace be upon you. you. First and foremost, I sincerely thank the organizers of today's event, SOAS Pakistan Society and Bloomsbury Pakistan for inviting me and extending me the honor of addressing you. This has also provided me with an opportunity to getting to know you or some of you at least, and the added pleasure of visiting SOAS again after 14 years. This is where my daughter obtained her undergraduate LLB degree 14 years ago. And from here, she went on to next door to do a LLM at UCL and a bar making her the first woman to become a barrister from the province of Baluchistan, my province in Pakistan. Uh, my father was the first barrister from Baluchistan at a time when it was not easy to travel, catching a steamship from the port of Karachi. He came from Pishin, which is about two, 600 miles from Karachi, close to the border of Afghanistan, then it was British Imperial India. So it was quite a journey to get here and be studied and to study here. The first barrister and the first lady barrister and I come in between them. All of us, all three of us went to the Middle Temple. I got my bar degree in the year 1982 and immediately after obtaining the bar degree, I managed to persuade my wife to marry an unemployed barrister. <laughs> she agreed. And this year, inshallah, will be our 40th wedding anniversary. We have three lovely grandchildren. And primarily because of them, that the future for me is important. And the future does matter. Person of, at my age maybe have, has seen his life pass and doesn't really should not be concerned, but it is the children which bring in the joy and the grandchildren that the future does matter. Recent world events may have ebbed the enthusiasm of the proponents of strong one man autocratic rule. It is essential all the more so, and it keeps reminding us that is, it is ever so important to have checks and balances and to reiterate the necessity to uphold human rights of everyone. Because if we do not do so, ours may crumble under a, an onslaught too. So this is something that we must remember and we forget that it's only my human rights when they are threatened that we stand up, but it is, you should stand up when it is the human rights of others. In that, there is protection for yourself too. The organizers are Pakistan-centric and I presume they would expect me to speak more in the context of Pakistan, but this lecture, even in other countries which have democracy, but where the roots of democracy are not have not grown deep to uphold the structure of democratic institutions, it, it may be relevant for them too. As far as my country, Pakistan, is concerned, the foundation of Pakistan rests upon the constitution of the Islamic Republic of Pakistan, that is the complete name of the country. Pakistan is a 
federal republic. It comprises of four provinces, the province of Balochistan, Khyber Pakhtunkhwa, Sindh, and uh, Punjab, and the Islamabad capital territory. The, co the constitution of Pakistan commences by stating that sovereignty over the entire universe belongs to almighty, almighty Allah alone, and that authority is to be exercised by the people of Pakistan. The second recital of the preamble refers to the will of the people of Pakistan and about state power. The people and the third represent, uh, recital talks about the chosen representatives of the people. So in a nutshell, the preamble mentions what Pakistan is or was and should be about the people, mentioned seven times, democracy thrice, fundamental rights, and its derivatives about seven times. The constitution mandates democracy, representative democracy. Each province of Pakistan has an elected provincial assembly and everyone above the age of 18 years can vote. The res residual power to legislate vests in the provincial assemblies and they can legislate on any matter except those as enumerated in the federal legislative list. And the provincial assembly, the person in majority who gets elected is referred to as the chief minister. And in turn, the, he uh, establishes his or her cabinet and that comprises of the provinces. At the federal level, we have the national assembly the body which legislates in respect, in respect of the federal legislative list. And in, at the National Assembly, the person who obtains the most votes becomes the prime minister who selects his or her cabinet of ministers from those amongst member, elected members of the National Assembly and the Senate. So the Senate, unlike the National Assembly, is equally represented. Each province has equal representation in the Senate and thereby it symbolizes the equality of the federating units of Pakistan. Senate, senators are not directly elected, they're elected by the members of the assemblies. The titular head of state is the president who acts on the advice of the prime minister in most matters and who in turn appoints the titular heads of the provinces, the governors, again on the advice of the prime minister. Now, there is a third very important tier of government, and that is the local government, which is, attends to local matters. And these are matters which primarily affect everyone's daily life. Roads, pavements, parks, hospitals, waste collection, water supply, maintenance of records of marriage, births and deaths. So these are the for a common Pakistani, the, the local government is probably the, the government that it, he or she comes in contact with continuously and should. The, but sadly enough, the local governments have been uh, the subject of manipulation in that sometimes elections were not held or they were held and the votes, uh, electoral system was such uh, that the it did not ref truly reflect who the people wanted. So it was considered by parliament, that is the National Assembly and the, and the Senate combined, and they amended the constitution. The, and that is known as the 18th amendment to the constitution, which brought about whole scale changes into the constitution. And one of them was to provide for the third tier of government the local governments in the constitution. So the status of the local governments was raised from what was written in a law to what is now written in the constitution. So no, nobody can change it by, by a law or by, by any other device. And the other most important thing was that it was mandated that the elections to local governments, which previously used to be arranged for and held by the provincial governments would now be held by the Election Commission of Pakistan, which is another constitutional body enshrined in the constitution. So these amendments were brought about by inserting a new article in the constitution, and that was Article 140A. I will now provide you with a pra the, uh, practical demonstration of 
the role of the judiciary in upholding democratic rights and processes, which is the subject of today's talk. So it's always good to connect what is written on a piece of paper with what actually happens and how it happens. I was, my bench comprising of two judges, myself and Sir, Justice Sardar Tariq Masood were hearing a matter when it came to our attention it, that the local governments of three provinces, Baluchistan, Sindh and Khyber Pakhtunkhwa, their term had expired some time back and no elections were held. And the matters assigned to the representatives of the local government were taken over by the provincial government and being run illegally. So, and another thing which came to our attention was that as regards the province of Punjab, the local governments which subsisted, they were sent packing uh, by administrative order and the governor of the province promulgated an ordinance, the Punjab Local Government Amendment Ordinance of 2021. So there was virtually, despite the fact that the constitution mandated the existence and subsistence of local governments, uh, their term was over and one had been illegally removed. The Punjab is, as you all would know, the most populous province of the country. And there were 56,000 elected representatives of the people serving on local governments in the Punjab. And the term of a, a councillor or a chairperson of a council or mayor is five years, as mentioned in the law. And they, before long before the expiry of the five-year term, were sent packing. This act was challenged by, by some of them by filing Constitution Petition Number 48 of 2019. And this was done on 18th December 2019. Dates are a bit relevant. It just shows what, how, uh, when things are not done in accordance with law, what can happen. The when the petition was filed, the registrar, and this is something which Sulema had also mentioned, uh, uh, the curtailment of unbridled discretion. The registrar of the Supreme Court took it upon himself to object to the filing of the petition. And he did this on the ground that it did not involve a matter of public interest. And secondly, that there was the petitioners would have obtained the same relief from the High Court. In other words, go to the High Court of Lahore. Uh, I should just mention that petitions filed in the Supreme Court are filed under Article 184.3 of the Constitution often referred to as Sumoto, though the word Sumoto does not exist in the constitution or any law of Pakistan. Uh, in fact, there was a judge visiting from here and on a conference, legal conference, and everyone was saying Sumoto, and he leaned to me and said, what is Sumoto? <laughs> I said, you don't know? <laughs> he said, no. <laughs> so I said, you go out in the street and the taxi driver will tell you what Sumoto is. <laughs> so, uh, Thereby, of course, suggesting that the taxi drivers in Pakistan are far more intelligent. So, leaving jokes aside, the, these objections were recorded. So, once a petition is filed and it is, it is objected to by the office itself, it's not the other side who's objected to it, it's the registrar who is objected to it. So, these objections are then, uh, appeal is against, filed against them, and that is taken up. Uh, and, but what the registrar then did was for three months, he did not even place this case before a judge in chamber who hears an appeal against an objection of the registrar. And after three months, the hearing took place on the 22nd of April, 2020, and the registrar's objections were overruled. So now the, you would imagine that the constitution petition number 48 of 2019, which was filed in December of 2019, would be fixed in court immediately for hearing. But this was not done. And it took six months before it was finally came to court. I cannot decide a case unless it comes before me. I cannot go to the cupboard, open it, and put it before me and decide it. So this is a classic case of, uh, I don't know what to call it, but it took six months to get to court. And the court, of course, what happens is you initially issue notice, you don't decide the matter because you have to hear the other side. So immediately it was such a case, of course, it merited notice and notices were issued. 
And then, despite notices being issued, we never heard of the case again. So our two-member bench then directed the registrar to have the petition fixed for hearing, which had been filed in December 2019. And if I may just read from a section of this order passed by this two-member bench, uh, of which I was a member, and I quote, if election matters are not decided at the earliest, people lose faith in democratic institutions. The said petition raised questions of immense public importance as the people of the most populous province of the country had been disenfranchised at the local level. By not fixing the petition for hearing, the registrar undoubtedly undermined the people's perception of the independence of the Supreme Court. We should continuously recollect that Pakistan comprising of East and West Pakistan could not be sustained when the people's representatives were not given their due. We cannot remain silent spectators to the disenfranchisement that has been brought about. And when those who have challenged such an act are effectively denied access to justice by administrative measures, it raises misgivings." Unquote. The petition was eventually heard by three uh, honorable judges of the Supreme Court and was, as you would expect, allowed. And the people, uh, the people's representatives, the 56,000 of them were restored to their position. So you would imagine that the people and the representatives won and that democracy had won. No, but it proved a pyrrhic victory because three and a half years it shaved off from their term of office. And even after the judgment of the Supreme Court, the provincial government did not drag its feet in implementing it. So this is sort of a case study, you can call it a case study where what is the law, what is the constitution, how it gets implemented, how cases are heard or not heard, and how decisions are taken is just a example of that. So the device which was used to wind up the local governments is an ordinance. The, this, this is something which is in England you don't have, but as a former colonial power, we still retain this is lawmaking by the executive. Uh, the president of Pakistan can make laws for a period of four months, which subsists for a period of four months unless they're earlier repealed by the parliament and the governors of the province have this power, they can make similar laws for a period of three months. But there is a very important provision, which provision is observed, um, has been observed more in the breach than anything else. And I, for one, rarely find an, uh, uh, an ordinance that is made, which is compliant with Article 128 of the constitution, which, and I quote, this can only be done when circumstances exist which render it necessary to take immediate action. But in this case, as you can see, there was complete absence of any emergency, let alone one requiring the taking of immediate action. In our order that we passed, we had noted, quote, the act of the governor was a fraud on the constitution, unquote. Governors, as, as I mentioned, are unelected, Yet, the government and the governor of the Punjab undid the decision of 370 elected members of the Punjab Provincial Assembly who had set up the local government in the province through the device of the ordinance and executive writ. In the absence of accountability and without there being consequences for those who violate the constitution, the, the downward spiral continues and the nation and the people suffer. Democracy and constitutional rule must be continuously safeguarded. We can never afford to take a back seat. And the greatest responsibility to do so lies on all those who have sworn to uphold and defend the constitution, including judges of superior courts on whom may lie the greatest responsibility of, of all. I'm one of them. However, the track record, which we must face up to, has not been spotless. Within a few years, there's some history here for you. Within a few years of attaining independence, democracy in Pakistan was derailed. Pakistan, mind you, 
was achieved by a great democratic struggle. Many people forget this. Many people don't realize how Pakistan was achieved that overnight it came into being. No, it was a great democratic struggle where it was voted upon, where the All India Muslim League asserted itself, established and gained enough seats in the territories which are now Pakistan and the former East Pakistan, now Bangladesh, and Pakistan came through democratic means. No battle was fought for Pakistan. They were post, uh, they were, when people came from over the borders, that was something else, but it was a very peaceful struggle of democratic rule where you attained, where we attained independence. So this is an important facet which you must remember. And, but having such strong democratic credentials and foundations on 24th of October, 1954, the Constituent Assembly was dissolved by the Governor General, Ulam Muhammad. And here is the first bad case, first good case rather. The President of the Constituent Assembly was Malvi Tamizuddin Khan. He filed a petition challenging the dissolution and the predecessor of the Sindh High Court was the Sindh Chief Court. It allowed the petition and the assembly was restored. But the gov federal government appealed and in appeal, the judgment of the chief, uh, Sindh Chief Court was overturned. By the, the author of the judgment was the Chief Justice Mohammed Munir who commenced by, def by defining democracy and went on to say that the Constituent Assembly, if I said these words without quoting them, you may not, you may think that I'm inventing them, so let me quote them for you. So the Constituent Assembly lived in a fool's paradise if it was ever seized with the notion that it was a sovereign body in the state. Can you imagine the who is? And with aplomb wrote, I'm quite clear in my mind that we are not concerned with the consequences, however beneficial or disastrous they may be." Unquote. Post Maurice Tamizuddin case, as decided by the Supreme Court, a new constituent assembly came into being and a constitution was framed in 1956. But this democratic dispensation did not last long either because then enters Major General Iskandar Mirza, who scuttled democracy yet again. Again, the Supreme Court, under the stewardship of Chief Justice Mohammed Munir, while hearing a criminal appeals, the famous case of the Doso case, endorsed the proclamation of 7th of October 1958, whereby Major General Iskandar Mirza had annulled the constitution, dismissed the central and provincial cabinets, dissolved the national and provincial assemblies, and had also declared martial law throughout Pakistan. A sad day in Pakistan's judicial history and the history as a whole. And how did the Supreme Court manage to do this? It justified its decision by relying upon the musings of Hans Kelsen. I don't know how many of you know about him. An Austro-German, and quoting him, this quoted, I mean, you know, uh, a lot of writers write a lot of things, you don't put them in judgments. A victorious revolution or a successful coup data is an internationally recognized legal method of changing a constitution. So this was the basis of that judgment. Major General Iskandar Mirza was ironically himself removed by his own appointee, that is General Muhammad Ayub Khan, who then proceeded to enact his own constitution in, in 1962. Now this is the 1962 constitution, but there was great public discontent and he handed over power in violation of his own man-made constitution to uh, General, Yaya, General Muhammad Yahya Khan, who then appointed himself as the president and the chief marshal administrator. Then emerges a dynamic young lady on the scene, who was then Asma Jilani, before her marriage, before she became Asma Jahangir, in whose honor this lecture is being held. 
and she was to leave a mark on the judicial history of Pakistan when she challenged the detention of her father, Malik Hulam Jirani, and the defense of Pakistan rules 1971, under which he was detained. She was joined by Zarina Gohar, who had challenged the arrest of Altaf Hussain Gohar, the editor-in-chief of Dawn newspaper. This is the famous case of Miss Asma Jilani versus the province of Punjab, 72 Supreme Court, page 139. And in this case, the Supreme Court overruled its own earlier decision in Doso's case. And I would like to read from a little short passage from this judgment. A perfectly, and I quote, a perfectly good country was made into a laughing stock a country which came into being with a written constitution providing for a parliamentary form of government with distribution of state power between the executive legislature and the judiciary was soon converted into an autocracy and eventually degenerated into military dictatorship. An all omnipotent sovereign now ruled over the people in similar manner as the alien commander of the army who has conquered a country and his will alone regulates the conduct and behavior of the subjugated population. The court ordered the release of the detainees. We would imagine that this would end now, but it continued. Democracy was again jettisoned when General Ziaulak struck at the constitution, which incidentally he had sworn to uphold, which every army officer does. He detained Prime Minister Zulfikari Ali Bhutto and imposed martial law on 5th July 1977. His wife, Begum Nusrat Bhutto, challenged Zia, General Zia's action. The majority of the Supreme Court upheld the military in intervention by holding that, and I should quote again, the extra constitutional steps taken by the armed forces of Pakistan was justified by requirements of state necessity and the welfare of the people. And this they did by advocating a new doctrine, the doctrine of state necessity. And these Latin phrases, which always get us into trouble, salis populi est suprema lex. So it sounds very officious and very legal if you use Latin. Uh, doesn't end there. Democracy was again elections, again democracy, Again, derailed democracy on 12th October 1999 by General Parvez Musharraf. And a challenge was made to his takeover. And the Supreme Court, this time around, through a 287 paragraph judgment, relying again on the doctrine of state necessity, endorsed the military takeover. And in doing so, they also bestowed upon General Musharraf the power to amend the constitution. The power to amend the constitution, only two thirds of the majority of the uh, National Assembly and the Senate can do. But here the power to do so was bestowed by a body which did not have this power itself, the Supreme Court, on a paid employee of the state, General Parvez Musharraf. Elections, as you know, were then held uh, in 2002. But this the, the first time in Pakistan's history, a dictator struck twice, and that was General Musharraf. And that was the declaration of the emergency on 3rd of November 2007. And he, as you all know, forcibly removed the Chief Justice, uh, Mohammad Iftar Chaudhary, and, and a number of other judges and uh, detained them. A nationwide protest ensued, of which uh, Asma Jahangir was a leading member, came to be known as the Lawyers Movement. Public pressure resulted in the restoration of the judges on 23rd of March 2009. The Sindh High Court Bar Association had filed a constitution petition in the Supreme Court challenging the 3rd November 2007 actions of General Parvez Musharraf. And this time, a 14 member bench of the Supreme Court assembled. And I have mentioned the numbers because all earlier judgments were, of course, of lesser numbers. So when there is a judgment of the Supreme Court where there are a greater number of judges than an earlier judgment where there are lesser numbers of judges, the one, the greater number of judges, judgment prevails over the earlier judgments. And uh, 
it's i think more profoundly the the main judgment was written by chaudhry iftikhar but the more profound comment was and epitely expressed was in six paragraphs by justice jawad as khwaja uh, and i would read from that judgment a short a short portion court can constitutional legitimacy flow from the force of arms or as is more graphically put at times from the barrel of a gun and if reliance on co- coercive force in gaining power is legitimized or condoned there can be no rational basis for decrying the assault on the writ of state by any band of marauders robbers adventurers and zealots of varying extremes in the political spectrum who undoubtedly will be encouraged in adopting similar use of arms and violence to force their ideological creeds on the people of pakistan he went on to say quote the people of pakistan have consciously chosen the method for their governance the constitution is a document which at a conscious conscious level records in classical terms the, the social contract between the people and those who they choose to entrust with the governance of the state and then he referred to the objectives resolution to uh, further the argument and uh, uh, went on to state quote in this context it was nothing but haughty arrogance on the part of general musharraf to claim to be above the constitution and to assume the power of arbitrarily amending it even if the concept of salus populi and the best interest of the people were to be involved it would in a way to believe demand adherence to the constitution because ignoring it necessarily implies the conceited notion that the people of pakistan who had chosen their own method of governance were ir- incapable of knowing what was best for them unquote the hope that was struck by the supreme court in the case of asma jilani and then in the judgment of the sin high court bar association has ensured that direct autocratic takeover is no longer possible but the nation needs to be vigilant you need to be vigilant i need to be vigilant all of us need to be vigilant and we must not let our guard down in protecting the constitution i will now <laughs> it mention was made of today being the international women's day so i am i if i'm permitted to sort of go off topic a bit <laughs> and on the topic of international women's day so i'll just uh, here to sad to say uh, performance of pakistan is abysmal i'm a great believer in there is no point in being the, the proverbial ostrich and ignore the problems you must face up to the problems you must realize what is wrong and only then will you address uh, the problem and that is what we should do and there is a global gender gap index uh which is i think issued by the world economic forum uh, in its global gender gap report of 2021 out of 156 countries that it surveyed pakistan came close to the bottom at number 153 Now, this is shocking for a country which gained, gained independence through a progressive leadership in which women were very much involved and in leadership roles as well the non discriminatory equality principle is embedded in islam and i quote from the holy quran chapter 49 verse 13 quote the most honored of you in the sight of allah is the one who is the most righteous there is no distinction in gender sex and i'll pose a little question here and uh, uh, sort of another defining feature i mean islam is part of a constitution in article 226 kind of you can't make any laws contrary to islam so i think i just want to make this point on international women's day and the great hero of the women's movement now being recognized in the west is hazrat uh, uh, is lady hajj the mother of hazrat ismail alay salam and she left a mark and a path that each and every muslim who goes to mecca for the performance of hajj or the performance of umrah follows in a woman's footsteps 
She ran between the mounds of Safa and Marwa, which is known as the Sai, and your Hajj or your Umrah is not completed unless you do this act. And as far as I know, and I'm not a doctor of theology, but I think this is the only example of a main religion incorporating something which has been established by a woman, a ritual established by a woman. Uh, I, I would like to be corrected, but I have not been able to discover any so far. And then we have the great, I mean, it doesn't end, it's not in, a, in isolation. The, the most revered of women in the Holy Quran, Lady Maryam, may Allah be pleased with her, is mentioned 34 times in the Quran, the mother of Prophet uh, Jesus Isa, much more than she is mentioned in the Bible. And then I would just, uh, before concluding, uh, refer to a hadith of the Holy Prophet Muhammad, peace and blessings be upon him. And this is relevant again for the International Women's Day. However large the faith of man increases, his regard for women increases. I'll repeat it. However large the faith of man increases, his regard for women increases. So this is an integral part of the faith. Uh, and we must acknowledge great women like Asma Jahangir. And one thing which, if you don't, if her daughter does not mind my saying so, she was a great troublemaker. <laughs> <laughs> and judges were terrified of her. <laughs> so I, I say that uh, in, uh, in, in uh, appreciation of her. Uh, so a bright future can only be secured when systems of oppression are dismantled, when gendered violence, misogyny, and abuse are punished in accordance with the law. Asma Jahangir had indeed set an example when she demonstrated that tyranny is not unsurmountable. The judiciary, like our electoral, electoral system, is a vehicle to secure the fundamental rights of all. The only future I would like to imagine is one in which persecution and autocracy ends. Thank you for patiently hearing me. And I once again want to thank the organizers and such a distinguished and more, far more educated <laughs> students that are here and professors. Uh, I have not received such a good education myself. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Justice Isa. Uh, I've been told by the Pakistan Society and Bloomsbury Circle that we have some time for questions and answers. And I, as the chair of tonight's lecture, am happy to take questions and pass them on to Justice Isa. We have about 20 minutes uh, time and before I actually hand over to questions, there's one housekeeping matter I had forgotten to point out, but I do it now. Emergency exits are on the left and right, and if a siren comes on, we all to leave from the... I know, exactly. I, I, I had bribed him not to tell them before. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> so, so without further ado, I'm going to just take it uh, in the order of appearance, and I might collect a few questions with your permission. And all of the parents. I'm so sorry, sir. Please. Thank you. Uh, that's part of your presentation. Uh, just a quick question. Would you still have faith in the democratic model in Pakistan, given that it has continuously produced uh, leadership drawn from a very few vested minority political family in power faction? Uh, which is inherently and historically joined Pakistan just to produce one corrupt government after another. Yeah. Okay. Uh. Yours is an extremely loaded question with a lot of assumptions. Leaving aside whether I agree with them or not, when it comes to a matter of faith, it's a matter of religion. Matters of constitution are not matters of faith. 
You have to abide by them, whether you like them or not. You live in England, you follow the law here. You live in Pakistan, you should follow the law there. Now, if, and taking the thing without commenting upon what you assume, which may or may not be true, do you have a better option? We've seen the options we've had. Did corruption go down? I mean, say, yes, it did go down under military dictatorships. Then, okay, fine, you were justified. But merely making assumptions and just denigrating the constitution of Pakistan and putting yourself over and above what the people of Pakistan, the people of Pakistan without slippers, without education, maybe dirty, maybe filthy, maybe you don't like them, maybe I don't like them, but they have decided how to govern themselves. And that is by the constitution of Pakistan. So we must all obey the constitution of Pakistan. These sort of questions, diaspora usually asks, why don't they question the governance in UK or America or Germany where they live? There they very really happily accept the governance systems. Let us be governed by what we have chosen to be governed by. Let us let, it, let some time pass. Let at least 30 years, 20 years in the life of a nation like this. It started with Magna Carta. And today we are where we are. So where is our journey? Where has our destination been? The country comprises not of land, it comprises of people. We lost half the country, why? Question that. Was it because of corrupt politicians? No. It was because of power hungry general that you lost the country, as simple as that. You did not re respect the people's will. I'm sorry if I don't want to come across as rude, but I feel very, I'm very clear about this in my mind. I mean, Article 5 says every Pakistani, wherever he may be, and if you're a Pakistan, then the constitution of Pakistan is bound, you're bound by it. Uh, on us, uh, people like presidents, prime ministers, MPAs, MNAs, army officers, judges included, we have taken on the added responsibility to uphold and defend the constitution, which you have not, but you, have, you are bound to obey the constitution. I hope that answers your question. Yeah, thank you very much. I'm looking over. Yes, please, sir. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, my question to Doc, uh, Justice Isa would be that: Do you regret your role in the Mamukade case? which created the illusion of a criminal case under the garb of a constitutional petition and a fact-finding inquiry. Was it fair on your part to describe anyone as disloyal to Pakistan in your report, that too without a trial? Before, Justice, before, before you, you answer, actually, I had forgotten this as a housekeeping matter. If you could just introduce yourself briefly and just give you give your name. And in fact, I should have done this with our previous speaker. My name is Asim and uh, I am a dissident Pakistani blogger who was abducted in 2017 and defended by Asma Jangir. And now I'm living in exile here in the UK. Thank you. Thank you very much. My name is Asim. Uh, this is for this might be have to wait for the third asthma junkie lecture. Uh, Asim, who does not tell us his surname, uh, Asif Asim Saeed. As far as that was a commission, there was not a case, and I was directed. Then I was a then I was a judge of a high court. Uh, and there were two other judges of high courts and the commission which you refer to as the memo commission was constituted. We were given a task. And if you read the memo commission report, it had exonerated and the allegation made, I won't name the persons, the, the what you referred to. And uh, that may be difficult for you to accept was when a ambassador of Pakistan, who is paid by the people of Pakistan, gave an undertaking in the Supreme Court to come to Pakistan, he violated the undertaking of Pakistan. I think it's a serious 
matter. We, we, what do you mean, have never heard? We, we were repeatedly calling him, please come, please come, and please come. Now, you, a normal person, you may be a dissident and elect to live here, but if you're a paid employee of the state, the people pay for you then, and particularly if you've added on, given an undertaking to the Supreme Court of Pakistan that you'll come whenever called and don't do so, then I don't know, then we don't have rule of law at all anywhere in the world. So uh, that's my answer. You may have your views on the matter, but uh, th that's how it is. Thank you very much. It's a question and answer session and not a discussion session. Please, madam. Um, they asked me to repeat my question because people. Okay, so the, uh, the question is the end. Shall I end my question? Yeah. So my question is about what is the role of judiciary in upholding the democratic rights and processes in areas which do not even have the constitutional rights in Pakistan besides being 70 years and more? Thank you. Uh, actually, Iram from, is from Gilgit, Baldistan, uh, acronym GB. <laughs> and it is uh, the territories of Pakistan are uh, defined in the constitution comprising of the four provinces and the Islamabad capital territory. And Gilgit, Baldistan, unfortunately, is not that part of the territory of Pakistan. It, yes, I know what you mean. I don't have the answer. It's extremely complicated and it will be probably you can have another whole seminar on this subject because it depends on treaties, uh, our position on Kashmir, et cetera, et cetera. I don't have jurisdiction in your territory, as simple as that. That's what the constitution is. If you amend the constitution, then <laughs> give us uh, jurisdiction like, like any other territory it's it's considered it's not mentioned in the constitution of pakistan it is a, it's a very complicated thing more political than legal uh, but uh, i empathize with your concerns and i went to gilgit baltistan recently and i fell in love both with the people of gilgitistan and the beauty of gilgit baltistan and if any of you have not been there that's probably one of the best tourist destinations in the world. Wow. It was such a... <laughs> <laughs> so we, I have, I mean, this is really very much like a source seminar. So, so I feel quiet at home because I see hands and <laughs> eager hands. Now I'm going to hand, so you, you have your hand up for, for quite a bit of time. So please. And yes, if you could always wait for the microphone, please, because otherwise our listeners uh, online can't actually hear the questions. I'm Dr. Masood Khan, not a lawyer or anything. Is all, are you, are you hear me? Yeah. Okay. No, 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 no. But I'm going to say to, uh, what I've read, I would say that judiciary has been subservient to those dictators, starting from not only Justice Tamizuddin Khan, Dosa, and all that. And we need to understand for everyone, they say that in Asma Jilani case, the verdict was delivered after Yahya Khan was gone. And then we go on to Justice Hassan Khan and Justice Nwarulak, and still the judgment in 2012, this uh, Hussain Akani, because that was a, honestly civ civilian supremacy versus martial law. And the last question would be, what about the disappearance of Balochistan people still? Whether it was Balochistan High Court, when you were the Chief Justice, and now nothing has been done, who is stopping us from doing it? Please, sorry about that. I, I think I myself pointed out where the judiciary's role has been, uh, for want of a better phrase, has been much to be desired with. 
and where it has judiciary is not a monolith it's not a building it's not an in, it's it's individuals make up the judiciary yes there are judges who have left a mark which makes me proud to be part of the judiciary and then yes there have been judges who have done otherwise and i mentioned the chief court of sin that those also five judges the, the chief court of sin and what happened in the supreme court and then again we have judges like justice jawad khaja the 14 member bench so yes it's it's been a mixed bag i i completely agree with you there as far as the case of missing persons is concerned i was uh, i became chief justice of balochistan uh, in 2009 and uh, i mean i don't want to say it because it may sound like a bit of a boast but uh, you're right missing person cases would not be fixed in court and uh, that changed and i designated a particular day which was incidentally tuesday when missing person petitions were fixed and previously what would happen was the case would be adjourned and no missing person case was ever adjourned a fixed date was given and the reason why we chose tuesday was because for, for that matter it just happened to be tuesday is because we would call all the concern that would be the the home secretary on that day that would be representative of the frontier con, uh, core not constabulary that would be the deputy attorney general that would be the advocate general and all others so each officer we didn't want to waste that they should be sitting there in every day and a number of missing persons were recovered uh maybe we we were not 100% successful but i think when i left there were like 89 missing person cases left uh where uh, results were not achieved but yes a great deal and if you may recollect when i went as chief justice of balochistan balochistan that was soon after uh, the the, the uh, akbar bukhti's killing and the position there was uh, uh, pretty tough uh, the first province in which the local government elections were held was in balochistan and i was told that this, this is law and order situation uh, i'll give you other examples the sibbi bench we have two benches in uh, balochistan then then the constitution was amended and now we have three benches of the high court the sibbi bench had been closed down because a rocket had been fired at a judge and i wanted to open open up the sibbi bench and i was told sir our law and order situation hai to maine kaha phir to aur bhi zarurat hai ke court wahan jana chahiye so i traveled the length and breadth of balochistan including areas which nobody else would go to and i must say together with my wife she was there with uh, me so i think the elections were held and if you recollect those elections which were held in balochistan were at a time when the returning officers at the request of all political parties unanimously were the district uh, district assessing judges and the only province where no allegation of brigging was made was balochistan and those in opposition then in opposition came into government if you remember those times so it's uh, yes one can only do that much but to say nothing was done unfortunately things what happened with sand didn't come on to the radar much uh, because uh, there is i think a certain media blackout kind of situation good news also as far as bad news as well so that th- those there were many issues but things started to improve and i personally think whenever there are whenever there is democracy you may hate each other but you are forced to talk to each other so so that is uh, the solution and when people start talking to each other problems get resolved uh, i don't know if i have answered your question that's the best i can do thank you thank you question is that 
Judiciary is also part of the society. And so, you know, there is an evolution of, of people, the kind of judges that come up. Uh, you mentioned politicization of the judiciary, but there is another problem, yet another problem, which is, a, which is corruption, which seems to, to have also seeped into the judiciary. I'm just wondering that what do you think that from 2007 onwards, how do you look at the judiciary are you satisfied? I mean, and, and how do you see uh, what kind of institution it has evolved into? When the, one of the problems is that it sees itself, sets it up uh, above all forms of accountability. Uh, you know, it's very, judges are very happy when they're not held accountable. I think like every other institution, maybe uh, there are different viewpoints within the institution, whether I'm satisfied or not, I think should not be important. It, the question should be whether you are satisfied, whether the people of Pakistan are satisfied. Uh, <laughs> sometimes I go and you go to a shop or something and at the end there's these smiley faces, were you properly served, et cetera, and then there's an unhappy face like this, there's a happy face like this. Maybe we should have some sort of thing outside the Supreme Court or the courts. I mean, were you satisfied? Were you dealt with properly? Uh, I, I, personally, if a person is satisfied, the, that person has stopped living. You should never be satisfied because then you stop striving. So it's not my satisfaction. It is whether, I mean, I, if I say I'm satisfied and then you can criticize me that, okay, you haven't done this, this, that, the other, or I'm not satisfied, it doesn't really matter. It is the perception, the understanding, because the cases which get into the public domain are very few. There are hundreds of cases one decides which you know nothing about, which matter nothing to you. But the cases which come into the public eye are the ones which determine <laughs> uh, whereby you grade us. The other cases, you would not even know what the case was about. I mean, that's a, the run of the mill business that we do. So I would not want to ever be satisfied. If I was satisfied, I wouldn't be part of the judiciary. I won't be. So I think if I can do something, that's the only reason which uh, took me to abandon my career virtually overnight. I was sent to uh, Baluchistan. I was asked, can you go there? Because we don't have a, uh, any, any, we don't have the judiciary there anymore. But if, if you recollect that they had taken oath under Dogar and they, all of them resigned. So I went, I was the only judge in the high, uh, high court in Baluchistan initially, and then appointed uh, judges, including the first uh, judge in the province's history onto the Bulusan High Court who went on to become the Chief Justice of the province as well, Justice uh, uh, Daira Safdar. So, an evolution, uh, yes. I, first of all, I think we must acknowledge mistakes because unless you don't acknowledge mistakes, uh, I mean, I will use, uh, I mean, first of all, you shouldn't acknowledge what you don't know. Then you acknowledge mistakes the famous hadith of the prophet, to say, I don't know is half of knowledge. So if we don't, I mean, we just kind of defend, keep institu every institution keeps defending him, uh, themselves. That's not a strength of the institution. That's the weakness of the institution. So I don't know what, uh, I don't know if I have answered. And as far as corruption is concerned, I, I don't, I, I mean, uh, I think that is unforgivable. Uh, in the judiciary more so, I would say more so than any other institution in Pakistan. And why do I say that is because other institutions, you're not, you don't expect to be given justice. But then when, when you go to the court of law, you expect to be treated justly, honestly, and fairly. Uh, again, I'll say something about myself, which I feel a bit reluctant about. When I became Chief Justice in Baluchistan, uh, there were like 400 odd employees of the High Court. And I said, please treat the people with respect. Treat them, as you are their uh, host and they are your guests. And, uh, and I told them the next thing. I said, no one comes to court happy. Everyone has a problem they come to. They don't come want to see my face. They don't want to see your face. So please serve them 
please serve them. And I said, there is another place where people generally don't go uh, for purposes of joy, and that's a hospital. But there too, there is an exception when a child is born. So I said, in our case, there is no exception. So I, I agree with you. There's much that one can improve upon. And, and uh, I think that all wraps it up. I hope I've answered your uh, question, Aisha Zika Saiba. Thank you. Uh, I'm now going a bit to, to the back. I'm sorry, we have far too, uh, not everyone will actually be able to, to ask the question and apologize in advance for this, please. And if you could just wait for the microphone, please. Hi, um, my question is that by um, the the chief. Could you just give? I'm so sorry. sorry you, oh, your yes, name? My name. My name is Halima Hijazi, and I'm a student here. Uh, so my question is that how I see the Supreme Court currently, the Chief Justice has a lot of powers. He can predetermine the outcome of a case by just composing a bench in a certain way, by keeping certain judges on the bench, and by preventing the others <laughs> from becoming the member. Um, so my question is, will Justice Isa as Chief Justice be, be, you know, encouraging some reforms in this sector? And also, he also almost became victim of this, um, not once but twice, <laughs> once initially when the uh, two judges who, had, who could have benefited from um, him getting, uh, you know, removed from the Supreme Court uh, were made part of the bench. And also when the judges who were sympathetic to his position were removed from the review petition stage. Thank you. Uh, reform, where do we start? I think the constitution, if we just abide by the constitution, we really don't need any reforms. For instance, there was criticism of, uh, you made the point about Sumoto jurisdiction criticism. I think most of the times we don't read the constitution. 184.3 says that a matter of public importance for the enforcement of fundamental rights, for the enforcement of fundamental rights, now, if you're not going to read those words and assume powers which you don't have, then uh, I will agree with Sulema 100%. But I have also assumed powers under 194.3, but every time I've done so, I've at least highlighted what was uh, the matter, of, that it was a matter of public interest. And matter of public interest means it does not involve only Halima Ijazi's rights, but if it's a representative, and the other thing is, it must be the enforcement of a fundamental right. I'll give you an example where uh, exercising Sumoto powers, loss was caused to the National Exchequer, and that was, uh, I won't name judges' names, but that was a, a tax imposed on uh, mobile phones and a certain amount gets deducted at source. So when you buy whatever 100 rupees, you get like 80 rupees or whatever, and the rest goes into various taxes. And that was that was suspended by the Supreme Court. And initially, and then when I came on the bench, uh, so it was a three member bench, and I said, which fundamental right is being violated? Which fundamental right guarantees you not to be taxed? That doesn't mean that a tax is correct. You can then challenge it through the regular mechanism where you challenge a tax, but you cannot do so under 194.3. So if we don't, I'm, I'm, I would consider myself a conservative judge. If you abide by the constitution and the laws, you don't, you're okay. When you start diverging and you start uh, inventing, inventing, uh, I mean, it's one thing interpreting in a manner which advances the relief. It's another thing inventing something which does not exist. This case in hand, where there was there is no fun enforcement of fundamental right, and uh, something has been done. And there are other uh, cases as well, which I'd rather not go into, but I think as a student of law, you may have studied. Uh, so <laughs> reforms is, if I'm there, if you give me suggestions and please criticize me as much as possible, uh, I have no problem with that. I think a healthy society criticism is good as long it's uh, it's meaningful. I mean, it's, even, I mean, sort of 
I mean, I wouldn't even mind if you abuse me, frankly. I mean, that doesn't matter. <laughs> Thank you. Please. Assalamu alaikum, Justice Saab. Thank you for your time. My name is Ismail Birzada. I'm from Islamabad and I'm doing my LLM at Queen Mary. I just wanted to ask, uh, in your judgment on the Fazabad Dharna, you wrote about the borderline sympathetic coverage of the TLP, the Harika Labbaik Pakistan. And I just wanted to ask you, how should the government strike a fine balance between guaranteeing our rights to free speech as Pakistanis versus restricting the spread of hateful content, particularly in a country like ours that is religious and where religion is not a private matter, but a public one? Thank you. I don't want to come in too much about that case because there is a review. There are many reviews pending. I can talk about generalities. The Constitution guarantees uh, freedom of expression in Article 19, but it also, I mean, for instance, if you advocate murdering someone, that is not freedom of speech in our law. Maybe in some other jurisdiction you can say that, but not in Pakistan. If I was to say murder, uh, I, let's smile. Smile is, in, is not a nice person. So that cannot be done in Pakistani law uh, under the Constitution as well as the law. So I would not want to go into the details of that case, but I don't know if you endorse the view or not, that is for you and for history to judge. Uh, but uh, when we bring in religion, I think the religion of Islam, which we keep forgetting, is a very peaceful religion. And it has been painted horrifically by people who and I don't think are serving Islam in the least. It is, it is the, the, the very, the word Islam is <laughs> peace, submission. I mean, why, how do we greet each other? Assalamu alaikum. I mean, and wa alaikum assalam or rahmatullahi barakatuh, it's sort of added on. I mean, how, why don't we gauge the conduct of the prophet? If you're going to stand up in his name, then why don't we emulate his example? There was, how, what did he suffer? Uh, how he suffered? That story of the woman who would abuse him and throw filth and garbage at him. One day she didn't. And he went to inquire about her. What's wrong with her? She was ill and she converted. So this is a religion of beauty and peace. And uh, so we are somehow scared when we use the word religious and I think the word religious should be used in a good way as opposed to in okay this is rich I better not touch it why not uh, this you are living in the Islamic Republic of Pakistan where the constitution preamble opens by say, saying sovereignty belongs to almighty Allah and to be exercised through his chosen representatives so so I don't know, I, I've skirted the question, but I would rather not till the matter is disposed, decided. Thank you. Madam, please. Yeah. Dr. Kiran Hassan from Institute of Commonwealth Studies. I must take this opportunity to first um, pay, pay tribute to Asma Jangir, who actually spoke very vociferously for religious minorities in Pakistan. And uh, we need to, I, I just wanted to ask you, um, Justice, if um, what, kind of, uh, what kind of a reform is the judiciary looking in terms of uh, issues regarding blasphemy, and especially with religious minorities and women? because there is a, that is a very serious issue that we've been dealing with for some time. And, uh, and if there is any kind of hope at the end of the tunnel. Thank you very much. I'm personally not a hot favorite of the term minority because everyone is a citizen of Pakistan and every citizen is equal. So, Try to avoid this phraseology of minority because you admire so-called, I mean, if you're talking belonging to a different faith, 
They have as much rights as a citizen of Pakistan than any other. And I am no one to raise a finger at them or them at me for that matter on religious grounds. Uh, as far as, uh, I don't know what specific question you want to, I mean, it's, you talk, spoke about reform. I mean, we keep forgetting, we don't, we don't reform. We implement and interpret the law where there are two interpretations possible. There may be laws which I don't like, but I still have to apply them. Where, where you want to change a law, go to parliament, that's their job. Or the courts, if they find our law to be a violation of a fundamental law, they can strike it down. But till such time, the law holds the field. And the only option then you have is how to interpret a particular piece of legislation. You can do it a particular way or do it in another way within the confines of language. I mean, you can't sort of completely disregard what it is said and say that this is actually what it means. Uh, so I hope that answers your question. Thank you. I kind of try to do it in the order of appearance. So, so I'm going to hand over, over that, so please. Yeah, uh, I worked as a journalist in London, and the question is short and sweet. How bright are your chances of becoming Pakistan Chief Justice? <laughs> uh, if you can guarantee me or assure me that I'll be alive the next hour, I'll answer your question. <laughs> Now, I'm going to, I did not call you, oh. but please go ahead, sir. Yeah, Justice Ab, uh, we learned recently from an interview of uh, Serena Kazi Faji, in which she revealed that there was a conspiracy to assassinate you. Would you please tell us who conspired against you? <laughs> Isn't it shocking for a journalist to ask such a question? That's his job. <laughs> So I let you do your job. I do mine. <laughs> now, ladies and gentlemen, we are actually coming to the close of, of our question and answer session. So I'm saying Marv Kichi to all those who had raised their hands and actually could not actually ask their questions. I'm, I'm really very sorry, but we just have only limited time. And actually, I think you're all with me in thanking Justice Issa for actually having agreed to, to take your questions and, and answer them. And the questions were robust, and I thought the answers extremely thoughtful. So I'm not going to go back to the lectern for concluding remarks because I think they're not really required. What I would like to do is to thank, first of all, our students and the Pakistan Society and Maheen and all her colleagues for having done a really wonderful job. We're very proud of them. To Dr. Nadir Chima and his colleagues at the Bloomsbury Pakistan who's done a wonderful job. To the staff and, and uh, of SOAS who kind of keep these premises running and, and us, all of us safe, also a big thank you. Of course, to, to Sulema Jahangir for, for having introduced the speaker and, and, uh, and really kind of, yeah, done a wonderful job also in reminding us of her, of her mother's work and contribution. And lastly, many, many thanks to Justice Issa for a wonderful paper and for having had the patience and uh, uh, to, to answer your question. Thank you very much, sir. And yes, I have pointed out the exits. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs>